will record uh, this webinar for uh, for our later reviews, etc. So, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for coming along and watching our webinar. This is uh, Costa Dium. Today, I have uh, two guests uh, who would like to give more uh, thoughts on peer-to-peer -peer lending, especially in this kind of COVID crisis. I have uh, Jones, who is a founder and owner of uh, Pay Angel Group, uh, which is uh, more than just uh, e-wallet. Also, it includes uh, remittance service, but uh, I'll give a word to Jones to express and to uh, introduce himself a little bit better. As well, I have the second speaker, uh, Emmanuel Lampti, who is an expert and uh, very well qualified accountant uh, for the UK and uh, Australia, who is uh, actually developing another solution to access uh, lending from uh, Central Africa. Now I'd like, uh, John, would like to add a quick intro about yourself. Thank you, Costa. Uh, what do I say? Um, well, as you already said, uh, I am the founder and CEO of uh, Paying Group Limited, and uh, we operate as uh, Pay Angel. Um, the the whole point behind uh, setting up Pay Angel is uh, uh, because we do believe that um, sending money to Africa is uh, an emotive subject, uh, but a very uh, expensive one, and um, the uh, current systems uh, do not really support. Um, Africans the way they should be supported. So in the grand scheme of things, when you look at product design, um, the costs, the service, and all of these uh, features, um, the services we have do not uh, support that. So PayAngel is the, the solution for that. And uh, that is what uh, we're looking to do. So um, I know you are into lending and uh, we are supporting uh, businesses uh, that want to receive money back home as well. So that's the value proposition of uh, PayAngel. Thanks for this, Emmanuel. Thanks Costa for, for the introduction and thanks Jones um, for that um, brief background as well. So yes, um, my name is Emmanuel Lamte, as Costa did mention, I am a co-founder of Money Zebra. Um, so what Money Zebra is um, essentially, you know, trying to do or provide our services to um, link borrowers um, in in Africa together with with lenders across other parts of the globe, uh, because we did identify that there is there is no um, real connection between um, these two categories of people um, between these two ends of, of of the spectrum. So that is what we are trying to to provide through an auction platform, which is um, technologically um, backed um, to, to link borrowers and lenders through um, an auction uh, feature. Yes, so that's, that's what Money Zebra is doing. And the, the end goal um, for us, I think, is to also contribute towards um, the United Nations SDGs and also um, improve the current state of financial inclusion and, and financial literacy. Yeah. I see. Uh, thanks, Manuel. Thanks, Johns. And uh, uh, why I really want to have uh, these two experts uh, here on the call, because uh, Johns mentioned a very crucial thing about uh, sending money to Africa. And probably the more important uh, part of this peer to peer business to withdraw money from the Africa. It's because uh, the majority of uh, local economies, they are definitely, almost almost all of them are happy to get money into the economy, but it's quite difficult to get money out or your investments. Let's say if you would consider uh, countries like Ethiopia, even to invest monies uh, into Ethiopia, it's uh, quite quite difficult and uh, it's more difficult to get money from Ethiopia and uh, the majority of African countries. That's why we have uh, these two experts. But uh, today we would like to talk about peer-to-peer uh, -peer platform that allows to access 
loans and uh, investment opportunities uh, from African countries. Uh, today also we would like to understand uh, different uh, ranges of other emerging platforms uh, that allow you to access different emerging economies to invest in and also how what are your uh, growth points to uh, grow your loan portfolio and um, what go going to be a, the best strategy for you investing into uh, these emerging markets? First of all, uh, Emmanuel, would you like to explain how what what, what the concept around peer to peer lending compared to crowd lending, and what what's the difference between when a group of people investing into a single loan and uh, when a individual investing or a business investing into a single loan? Um. Thanks, Costa. I think it's, it's quite um, self-explanatory. So with, with peer to peer lending, it's usually one individual to another individual uh, in plain terms. Okay. Usually what happens is it cuts a lot of paperwork, which you, you often get in a traditional form of lending or borrowing where you go to a traditional bank or a high street bank where you have to go through a lot of KYC procedures. Um, peer to peer lending obviously helps you to cut down um, these these long chains, um, if, if I can put it that way, um, or this um, cumbersome um, exercise. Whereas, you know, crowdfunding is more of a, a group of people investing into, into a, a business or into, into an idea or into one platform. And that is, that is the key, that is a key um, variation between the peer-to-peer -peer lending and the crowdfunding. But both, both of these uh, these um, types have, have become very popular uh, over the past few years and you know they, they are gaining a lot of traction a lot of people are beginning to invest money into into these um, these sectors or these industries um, and you know it's, it's quite quite lucrative but um, obviously with with any with any form of investment you have to look at you have to look at the risks involved you have to do your research and find what really works for you um, but yeah, just to, to answer your question and to clarify what the difference is. Peer-to-peer -peer is usually individual to individual um, or person to person. And then also the crowdfunding is more like a group of people to into one, one idea or to one person. Yeah. I see. What, what, what is your, your personal preference? Uh, would you like to go with uh, just your personal opinion as an expert from this area? Would you like to go with a crowd lending either peer to peer? What would you prefer? That's, that's a bit of um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's a bit of a, of a tricky one. I think it's very, um, it's very individualistic. Uh, like I said, um, in my, in my initial um, submission, you, you need to weigh, you need to weigh the options really and see what works for you as an individual. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't want to say something here and then someone will probably say, okay, well, Emmanuel said this, so that's what I'm going to go for. Um, yeah, always, always look out for, for what works best for you. I mean, I've explained the, the two main differences, um, sorry, the main difference between um, both, both types, uh, but you know, the, the, the choice at the end of the day is yours. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's what I think I'll I'll say about about these these two. Um, yeah, All right. if, if if I should go a bit further, maybe I'll I'll, I'll be more I'll be more leaning towards towards the crowdfunding, um, and that is that is um, when I'm being I'm being very um, you know risk neutral or risk averse. But if, if I'm if I'm being more adventurous and I want to take um more risk on, then I'll, I'll rather go for the peer-to-peer -peer lending. Um, yeah, I think that's what I'll say, because the crowdfunding has more people. So if you, if you see a lot of people investing in a, in a particular asset, it's like, you know, having mutual funds, you, you know, you're not, you're, not, you're not by yourself, you know, and um, you're, you're with a group of people and that's, that's that mentality. Yes. That's true. Jones, what do you think? Do you do you have any accounts? Do you investing uh, by yourself into peer to peer or crowd lending or crowdfunding? Uh, I have actually, and uh, I've even started a business uh, that um, um, kind of leveraged uh, something that was uh, done um, in African communities, um, which is uh, pretty much uh, people lending money to each other. 
you know, I come from a banking background, but um, I also do believe that uh, banking is all about uh, really um, uh, having access to money and uh, passing it on and uh, making uh, some um, um, margin. Of course, uh, we've uh, made it all complicated now with the investment banking and all. But uh, I personally don't have a preference. I could uh, go with um, either uh, option, depending on the, the mechanics um, of uh, the platform that's uh, um, offering. So I'll just quickly pick on the, um, uh, what um, Emmanuel said at the end. Whereas uh, with um, crowdfunding, you have uh, the peer validation and you have uh, um, the head mentality, that could actually be um, uh, the wrong way to, to look at investments because um, those who go into it first may then uh, provide a social proof which may be a false, <laughs> which may be um, false, right? Um, not all social proof um, is um, false um, and you then get led uh, to, um, onto the right path, to the wrong path. However, if you, um, that platform provides information about um, a lender or a borrower and um, you can make your own analysis, um, let's say um, the, uh, the borrower, um, you are able to show the borrower's uh, credit history and if they are already on the platform for a long time, you have uh, some form of uh, internally generated history, I'll be more comfortable making um, a loan to that person than uh, being part of um, uh, a crowd uh, funding um, uh, platform. However, on the on the flip side, um, crowdfunding um, you may diversify your risk. So to that extent, um, crowdfunding will work if I'm looking for a, a, a diversified uh, risk portfolio. Uh, on the other side, if I'm looking for a better deal, I may consider. Um, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer. so it comes down to the dynamics of uh, the situation yeah john so i totally agree with your opinion is because uh, when you're investing as a group of people uh you probably uh getting convinced by the whole group that is probably a good opportunity and uh, uh many people trust uh to these deal trust to this case to this application but uh, this group mentality brings you lower uh, lower profit, lower rate, uh, because it's kind of uh, lower risks, but compared to what you've said uh, about peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, when you are making a personal, a very individual decision in to, to go this, into this uh, investment or not, it's totally different approach. Uh, uh, personally, I have uh, two accounts uh, at uh, two different uh, European peer-to-peer -peer platforms and uh, happy to share my, my experience and uh, my achievements with uh, both platforms. At one uh, platform, I'm investing into uh, one, two, three, uh, four economies. First of all, I'm investing across Europe. Uh, predominantly into Polish market, Polish uh, short-term loans. The second market, it's a uh, market of Kazakhstan. It's because they promise uh, quite lucrative uh, feedback. Then I'm investing in Mexican market. And uh, also uh, I'm investing in the UK, like a domestic market. What I found interesting that uh, when you are considering, let's say, investing into uh, Mexico and uh, you need to invest your uh, local currency, it's called peso, as, as I assume, uh, the, uh, the loans promise you, uh, I mean, a crowd, a crowd lending um, a return up to 18%. It's quite nice, but again, if you will add a fix, uh, risks, if you will add uh, local currency, potential uh, currency default risk, etc., etc., probably this is a premium you're paying for this uh, very, I would say, for, for our UK and European rates, a very high uh, return. It's like your premium. 
uh, almost the same in Kazakhstan when you're using a local currency called Tinge. Uh, you're getting back again from 12 to up to 17% back on a return of, of your investments. But at the same time, again, the same risks are involved into these uh, two economies compared to let's say eurozone or uk when you are investing into peer-to-peer -peer, i mean uh crowd in crowd lending platforms you're getting back from six to eleven percent depends on the risks of loans you don't have that high premium because uh, risks are much lower what i found useful uh that and sharing my, 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 my personal pain with the whole audience and with you guys that uh, um, a few loans I actually hold, they are going and it seems to be go to defaults uh, or bankruptcies uh, because of this uh, COVID crisis. Uh, it's good to have some protection and buyback guarantee by the platform, by their uh, loan originators. It's good to have, but again, uh, the whole uh, picture about the actual situation uh, that I couldn't find any loan opportunities, any investment opportunities in Mexico. Uh, maybe it's because uh, my, my personal settings or my filter but uh, before the COVID I was uh, able to invest a sufficient amount of money and uh, there were many investment opportunities uh, hundreds or even thousands of loan applications from Mexico uh, that fit to my requirements but uh, now I couldn't find uh, any proper investment that fit to my requirements. Emmanuel, do, do, do you have any anything similar or Emmanuel? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah what, what 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 do you think about uh, emerging economies and the COVID crisis and uh, rising uh, bankruptcies for loans? Um. Yes, I think I think going forward, I mean, pre COVID nineteen, sorry, pre COVID nineteen, things things were, you know, just usual um, in, in in the normal scheme of things. Um, but during the COVID nineteen, um, certain central governments and um, um, the, the the UN the UN CDF, I think the UN United Nations Capital Development Fund, for example, um, they. They were within imagine, imagine markets. They were looking at ways by which they could support individuals and small businesses um, just to survive um, this this phase of the the pandemic. Um, going forward, uh, post COVID nineteen, I think that you know investors will be more cautious because um, there will be more uh, default rates. Um, you know, people will borrow money and they might not necessarily be able to to pay back. Because it's it's been very tough over the over the, uh, the the past few months, people have lost their jobs, so liquidity has become a problem. Cash flow has become a problem, and it's very challenging um, for for individuals. Um, some credit bureaus and some credit agencies have actually cut down the credit limits on their uh, some some credit cards, for example. Um, I wouldn't want to mention names, but you know this is this is how the climate is looking like, and um, you know interest rates are going to go up because. Um, in, investors would expect more because they're taking on more risk, and that that is that is the kind of phase we are currently moving into, um, you know, post COVID nineteen. I see, I see. Uh, Jones, uh, based on uh, your data as a provider for remittance services, uh, what uh, what do you see? What 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 data says you? What what a statistic about? Uh, uh, moving money across borders uh, is uh, is your amount uh, moved up or uh, went down? What's going on with the market of remittance services, especially in terms of African emerging economies? The, uh, that's a very good question, actually. And um, uh, it, it's almost um, what's happening is almost counterintuitive. Um, and um, uh, the the World Bank um, predicted that. Uh, remittances will fall by um, 20% uh, because of the, of the pandemic. And uh, a lot of institutions have reported seeing um, this, uh, this draw. 
And in fact, um, in March, uh, we started, um, we saw a drop in um, value by about uh, 5%. But the interesting thing behind uh, uh, the data we realized is that um, as a, uh, whereas the value was going down, um, the volume in terms of count actually shot up. And um, it's, it's easy to, uh, to see why. We are a digital um, remittance provider. So whereas um, the economy was locking down and uh, people um, who used to go to the shops couldn't um, visit the shops, we, they started registering or looking for um, digital uh, remittance providers like ourselves. So we had already positioned ourselves in that space and um, uh, we were incentivizing people as well to make sure that instead of uh, sending um, cash to cash, we were incentivizing others to make sure that they take advantage of the fact that we provide choice. So you can send to mobile money and send to a bank account and um, the speed is um, the same. So there's no reason why you should be sending for somebody to go and pick up and introduce uh, uh, others, the tellers and themselves uh, to risk. So pretty much uh, we saw a slight dip and a very sharp increase in, um, in volume initially. And uh, once the economy started to open up, we then realized that um, both volumes and uh, values uh, went up uh, significantly. So um, it's, uh, you could almost say that uh, within the, um, this uh, uh, crisis, people are realizing that uh, digital is the way to go. So there are a lot of people moving to the digital space and uh, PayAngel is um, a beneficiary of that because uh, we took the decision earlier on that uh, we want to be in the digital space. Um, we see it as the way to disintermediate, uh, reduce costs uh, and uh, the efficiency gains that uh, we are able to, um, to make, we pass it on to the end user, and uh, we're benefiting from that right now. Yeah, I see. Just, just to, sorry, Costa, just to add to what James said regarding um, the spike um, in the volume or the demand in, in digital platforms. Relating to um, Money Zebra, one of our digital partners in, in Ghana, um, you know, got, got this bid to, um, to open up applications for individuals who need this kind of funding or support uh, through the government you know the government was providing some sort of relief um, in a matter of four weeks they realized um, applications over one, one million you know within the informal sector and that alone tells you you know how much people are in in, in dire need of, of, of um, digital services and, um, and and loans or you know credit facilities Yes, so you know, just to add to what um, Jones Jones was mentioning about volumes, that there, there has been a rise um, within within the, the the industry and certain parts of of the world when it comes to when it comes to uh, borrowing or asking for for funding. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Manuel. Uh, just 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 want to uh, continue with you. Uh, uh, in the UK, the government established a bounce back uh, loan program for small enterprises, for small businesses, for medium businesses. So there is a huge support, but not uh, all the governments around the globe are were able to uh, accomplish the same level of support for local businesses. I think uh, a big portion of uh, these requests should go to uh, very conscious investors who would like to support uh, some markets like uh, communities who are living abroad uh, to support their uh, motherland economies, etc., etc. But from an investor uh, perspective, from an investor point of view, what should investors uh, expect for the next uh, six months or a year perspective, as you mentioned, like a post-pandemic uh, period in, uh, from the microfinance market? What, what, what do you think they should expect? Yeah, I'm muted. Or is that to Jones or to myself? Uh, yourself. All right, yeah. So, um, 
Yeah, I mean the the, the bounce back loans. I think it was 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 a brilliant scheme by uh, you know Rishi Sunak and, and the government. Um, Two point five percent within six years. Brilliant. Um, it's, it's it's very difficult to come by uh, such such a such a scheme. Um, small like free money, but um, you know if if you're looking at it, looking at it in the long term, I feel like um, a lot of companies are going to going to default because it was it was all about the news that um, some companies are already filing for for bankruptcy and you know they've gone into liquidation because they're having cash flow problems and liquidity issues. Um, so that's what it's going to look like, and we are going to be experiencing more of such um, such cases. And that people will not be able to to pay back the loans. Um, for investors, I think I, I, I did mention that earlier that going forward, um, investors need to be you know very cautious wherever they they, they invest their money or where they put their money. Um, although there there is high risk and you you might be expecting high returns. Uh, bear in mind that if you're investing in P two P or you know crowdfunding platforms, um, you, you you stand a, a very high risk of not you know making enough return. Um, in in that aspect, on the you know when when you look at borrowers who will be defaulting, the rates at which people will be defaulting, um, you know you have to obviously factor that into it. But long term, you know after this whole thing phases off and you know the markets re re begin to take shape and then things begin to restructure, you know things will, will, will become more more sound and you know your 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 returns will start growing. So it's it's at this point I think it's better to look at. It's better to look at the long term rather than just say six months, which is just half a year. Look at the long term gains rather than focus on the on the immediate immediate returns. Yeah, because in the longer term, you know, you're you 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 have a higher chance of you know having a, a higher return. It's like looking at the yield curve. The longer it takes, the higher your return. So, but uh, uh, Emmanuel, uh, are you talking about uh, investing into longer term uh, loans or either to Investing for longer, for more short-term uh, investment opportunities. What, what what is an idea behind? Um, well, so you can look at it. You can look at it from from two ways. Um, investing in long-term loans, okay, which obviously will take probably longer to 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 pay back, or doing investing in um, bits like chunks of short-term loans, um, and then averaging it out. Okay, knowing that in the long term you are going to strike that balance and then make make some sufficient returns, so you can look at it from two two angles. I see, I see. Uh, thanks for the opinion, uh, John. What are your what are your your thoughts in terms of uh, strategies uh, that will be, let's say, the right for the next for the following year, especially for the past COVID era. Well, um, there are two, two things I see post-COVID. Um, um, I think it's been in the news that um, during um, the pandemic, um, the, the bigger companies, uh, the, um, the big um, tech companies, um, Amazon, Google, etc., they've all seen um, uh, a sharp increase in um, uh, the value they, um, they derive uh, from the market. And uh, of course, um, uh, that is only natural because of their positioning. Um, and um, big company will still um, win in the short term because uh, uh, the reason why we use uh, even banks is because um, uh, there is lack of trust and uh, risk in the system. And um, the banks uh, create bureaucracies uh, to be able to manage the trust, uh, lack of trust and uh, risk. And uh, the likes of us feed into that because uh, they take away um, those issues from us. Um, and uh, I see that's uh, continuing because uh, although fintechs uh, and um, smaller agile companies are trying to have been trying to disintermediate and uh, take away that wrestle away that power from uh, the bigger companies. Uh, the pandemic like um, COVID um, does uh, resets everything slightly in their favor because um, if you are um, going to invest as in uh, put your money with a, um, a company at this moment um, you, uh, the first thing is going to be uh, you're going to be thinking about is the safety of your money 
And in that case, uh, instead of uh, investing with uh, uh, a more agile, um, fast growing company, you're going to be thinking maybe for this moment, I'll rather put it with a bank because uh, that is uh, basically their, their value proposition. The banks are there to make sure that they create trust and uh, remove um, uh, some of the risk. However, uh, on the flip side, I see um, technology companies um, that are well set up uh, with the right strategy uh, winning, just as the big tech companies uh, have done. Um, it will take uh, long term, and now may be the time for those with uh, a little bit of um, capital to start looking at uh, the best companies to invest in because um, you can only go uh, upwards, right? You can only um, go up. So if you pick the right um, stocks, the right companies, um, you can then um, look at investing in those because uh, once the economy takes off, um, those businesses are going to grow very fast. Um, and um, as an investor, if you are an investor and uh, you have the entrepreneurial mindset, this is the time to start thinking about uh, what uh, you can do uh, as a result of this pandemic um, to invest your own money um, in your own enterprise because you have identified a gap uh, in the market. So I see um, the big corporates um, uh, doing well because uh, they still provide some form of security. And I also see a lot of uh, tech startups um, doing well because uh, they have positioned themselves well. And uh, just to um, reiterate, um, the long term is um, the long term horizon is what uh, people should be looking at, not the short term when it comes to investment. Uh, I see. Yeah, go on. Just, just wanted to add a quick one. I mean, shifting the focus from just P2P lending or crowdfunding and then looking at investments um, as a whole, um, like Jones was saying, you know, tech companies, you know, have, have survived uh, regardless. They've, you know, they've, they've, they've been able to make it out of COVID and they are still, they're still making their, their returns, you know, stock, their stock prices are, are, are going up. And that, that, is, that is another thing that investors need to look at. Um, the industry that you're thinking of investing in or where you want to put your money. Um, look, at, look, look, at, look at what the trend, the trend is saying. Look at how the, the industry or that sector is performing and responding to COVID-19. Um, so e-commerce platforms, for example, are doing very well. Um, Jumia, I think about two weeks ago, their share price was less than, it was less than $10.00. Sometime last week, it, it, showed, it went to about 20 something dollars uh, per share, you know. So these are some of the things that you should be um, obviously taking into consideration because they, you know, regardless of the COVID, they are still in high demand. Um, they, are, they are essential and, you know, people are going after them. So once there is demand, there is traction, um, you know, prices are high for them. They, they, they are in a comfortable position to decide. But once they are not doing that well and um, there isn't too much traction or there isn't too much demand for their products or their services, um, then that's where the issue is. So yeah, that's, that's another thing that investors should, should sort of look out for moving forward. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting. Um, guys, I've got, I've got another question just uh, in regards to a couple of points we have uh, touched. Uh, in terms of geographies and uh, different level of trust, different level of risks. Uh, Jones, uh, I definitely know that you have a very global experience with uh, launching your uh, project by Angel. Uh, as I am aware of, you're actually operating from the UK, from uh, Ireland to cover the European market. And uh, recently, you have launched your activities in Canada. But uh, in, uh, it, it means, let's say, when uh, I am a user of your platform, your digital remittance service, uh, and if, you, if I, based in Europe, I deal with your Ireland-based uh, company, but in terms of different risks, should investors consider 
uh, in which country the platform registered as a business. I mean, the, the P2P platform they're using as a tool to access loans. Because what I found that uh, some of uh, platforms uh, registered in uh, Latvia, some of them registered in uh, uh, some very offshore countries like Cayman Islands uh, or Panama, uh, I found a couple of platforms registered uh, in Mauritius. What, what is your opinion in terms of risks using these tools uh, to invest uh, bigger amounts of money in terms of geographies and risks? Uh, when it comes to financial services in particular, um, choice of uh, jurisdiction is, uh, is key. Um, you, you have to uh, do a lot of research on it before you even uh, uh, make a move. And uh, when we are talking about uh, choice of uh, jurisdiction, it's, uh, it starts off with um, the broader picture of uh, the region. Then you zero in on the, um, the specific country. Um, if we take the EU, for example, the EU obviously adopts um, a principle-based um, uh, regulatory um, a framework. Uh, and uh, allow the individual um, member states to interpret it uh, however they want. What that means is that uh, whereas uh, from a principal point of view, they all have um, the same set of rules, the individual countries um, then decide what they want to do um, uh, in terms of how it's implemented. So if you look at uh, the, the EU, people are choosing some of the, the countries you mentioned and now particularly uh, Lithuania, uh, Estonia, and places like that, because they are a lot more friendly and um, they are uh, open to working with um, uh, businesses as in fintechs, et cetera, to make sure that they understand their need and uh, interpret the, uh, the overall legislation to meet the business needs and therefore enable them. So jurisdiction is, uh, is a key thing. Um, uh, of course, the country you operate in is uh, very key. So once you're able to plant yourself um, in one country and that, that country is uh, good to you, you are able then to passport your services across uh, the other countries without any um, uh, restriction because at the end of the day, you are going to be operating within the principles. So that is a, that is a key thing to consider. Now, if you move outside the uh, EU, um, for example, you go to places like the US, then it becomes a, a different uh, <laughs> ball game. Um, and a lot of companies are finding out uh, uh, that uh, the US is very strict and uh, very prescriptive in terms of uh, how um, they legislate. And um, most um, fintechs have, uh, uh, as a result, fallen far off the law because they think that uh, they thought that they could uh, operate um, as they have done uh, in Europe. Um, they can operate uh, the same in the, the US. Unfortunately, that's not the, uh, the case. So um, you always have to choose the right place to be in. Places like Mauritius and uh, particularly Bermuda are very, very open. And uh, those are the places where if you're looking to uh, set up, uh, you should um, start considering them. And of course, um, if you set up in there, um, which other markets you can operate in would then become uh, the question to address. So uh, jurisdiction, uh, I would say is a, um, it's one of the key stuff. That does not mean that uh, with us, we don't have to um, uh, obtain licenses in different countries. So we do have uh, licenses, um, as you rightly identified, in uh, all the different um, markets that we, we want to be in. But uh, in Europe, um, it's one of those things that uh, you have to choose the right country so that you get the right support. I see and totally understand. Uh, Emmanuel, uh, I know uh, recent years you have been traveling to um, some African countries. Uh, could you tell us please about uh, the local regulatory framework, uh, for example, in uh, Ghana, Nigeria, maybe uh, uh, surrounding countries. Is this okay for now uh, for foreign investors 
to trust local platforms that based uh, there, especially in African countries. How the local government, the local law protects foreign investment at the moment? What, what's the landscape now? Um, well, yeah, I, I think currently that the, the landscape is it, it, is quite friendly um, because of the emergence of of technology and the fact that uh, a lot of fintech companies are are on the rise and you know are scaling up. So this is something that a lot of African countries are embracing. If you look at um, Kenya, for example, you look at um, Nigeria and Ghana, which is also uh, becoming a, a, a fintech hub. I think you know governments are are being more. Um, accommodating and yeah, being more receptive sorry, receptive to, to this whole idea. Um, you know, obviously before you, you think of setting up in Africa, you, look, you need to look at what's, what the requirements are, um, what kind of licenses you need to, you need to have, um, the legal regulations, taxes, um, you know, for example, if you're, if you're based in Europe and you're thinking of setting up say, a subsidiary in Africa, um, what are the corporation tax regimes VAT, um, something like double track, the double tax treaty, which we have in the UK. Um, is it is it efficient? Is it effective for you? Does it does it fit into your business model? Um, so yes, of of course, these are these are all questions that need to be answered. Um, and if you if you talk about if you talk about traction, if you talk about the demand, I mean, one point two billion people, especially in Africa, um, that 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 is that is unmatched, um, and 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 the demand keeps keeps rising. So. Um, Af African markets are, are being very responsive, but not, I mean, obviously not all of them. Um, you need to identify which one works best for your, your business model and, you know, in terms of your, your target audience and what you, 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 you tend to, you want to achieve in the long, in the long run, if, if that fits your, your appetite. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with you. It's because, uh, Let's say if uh, if you are based in Europe and just uh, uh, in regards to what Johnson said, uh, if you're based in European Union and into, if you're investing through Europe-based uh, peer to peer platform, you're mostly protected by the European law and uh, yeah, you are. And uh, Emmanuel, I think you can add uh, a couple of uh, points in regards to uh, investors' protection uh, provided by the local partners, so local loan originators. Um, well, I mean, re regarding investors' protection, yes, that there, there are there are certain things in place. So, um, I think. If you've heard of the um, AFTCA, which which has been uh, launched recently, I think it was meant to be uh, fully fledged by June 2020, but because of COVID-19, um, that has been that has been shifted to I think Q1 of 2021. Um, so the the first the first center was opened up. Um, the South Castle was done I think two or three days ago in. In, in Accra, Ghana. So that obviously is also going to open up things a lot within, within the African region. Um, in terms of investors, uh, things such as um, the open banking system, which we have here in Europe, doesn't, doesn't work in Africa. We don't have such a thing in Africa. So um, investors need to identify how they will also be protected um, in terms of foreign exchange, for example, because if, you are, if, you're, if you're investing your cash um, in, in say you know you've got euros you want to invest in in naira or in cd these are some of the things that you need to ask yourself that you know how is my money protected uh, what are the banking regulations um, in terms of anti-money laundering um, and then also fraud protection uh, what, what what are your returns looking like if your if your cash is is in is in a foreign currency and you you know you you, you invest it in, in a local currency what does that mean for you but um i mean generally i think um investors are obviously uh, very very well very well um protected and and, and, and they, are, they are taken care of by all these um these um providers these lending providers i see totally agree with you jones do do you have anything to add to well, um, I, I'll just uh, pick on the last thing uh, you said, uh, really. Uh, if um, you live uh, in the UK, for example, and you want to invest uh, in, uh, in Ghana, um, you have to uh, think about beyond all the regulations and everything, you have to uh, decide whether you want to invest in uh, the Ghana cities or um, in pounds uh, to protect yourself. Because uh, whereas uh, it might look like um, 
the um, the rate you get um, on the city, it's uh, very attractive and uh, much better than um, uh, what you get on the pound. It might end up being, um, uh, you might end up uh, getting it all wrong because of uh, the movements in exchange rates, um, etc. There's a lot more inflation um, in um, Ghana, for example, than uh, or in, the, in the UK, and that erodes uh, the value. So these are all things that um, you have to be thinking about. Uh, um, and for me, as an investor, that's one of the key things that you have to think about beyond regulation, of course. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, sorry, because I'm, I'm glad that um, Jones did, did mention, um, you know, the the currency fluctuations and the returns. So one, one point that I'd like to make also is that um, although it might, the returns might seem very attractive in, in CDs, um, it's, it's not the same when you, when you bring it to, to pound sterling, okay? Because um, the, the main, and, the, and the main reason for this is in, in Ghana, our, our bank rate or our interest rates is, is rather high. Um, you're looking at, you know, two digits uh, figure. Right. Whereas if you come to the UK recently, it's, it's been slashed um, drastically um, to not point, I think not point five or so. Um, I stand to be corrected. But yeah, th these 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 two um, interest rates are completely different. Right. And usually what happens is in countries where they have very high interest rates, um, it tends to favor the, the investor uh, or the, the lender than the borrower. Okay, and in countries where there are very low interest rates, like the UK, for example, um, if it's, it's it's vice versa, it favors it favors the borrower than the lender because you, you you pay less as compared to how much you're you're taking, and if you're if you're in in Ghana, um, you're 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 getting more than you know you're you're, you're taking out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally agree. That's why uh, those uh, those markets it's called emerging markets, and they are rising and rising very rapidly. Because uh, Ghana is, uh, as I'm aware of, is uh, the second fastest growing market uh, in Africa. But uh, all of these, uh, like Europe and UK, more established markets. Yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely clear. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's good and lucrative for investors to support emerging economies is because it's uh, definitely a place to make money. Uh, now I'm I, I really want to thank you, the audience, uh, the attendees we, uh, who watched the webinar today. And my very big thank you to our speakers, Emmanuel and Jones. Uh, I think to catch up with you later in person for a cup of coffee, tea, a lunch, dinner, etc. Uh, for all our attendees, uh, feel free to uh, email uh, questions if you have any to us we will uh, forward them to our guests and we'll reply thank you thank you have a good day bye bye